Today we're finally making one Octane 3 all, which is something I've been trying to make for a while now. It's sometimes used as an artificial mushroom flavor, but what I find interesting is that it's a chemical attractant for biting insects. It's naturally present in both human sweat and breath, and this is one major way for insects like mosquitoes to find us. I first tried to make it by the acrolein bromopentane route, but unfortunately my acrolein polymerized before I could use it. Luckily for me though, the paper that I was following had a secondary route that I could follow. This new route involved two major steps. The first step is an aldol reaction and condensation, and the second is known as a mirvine pondorf verli reduction, or MPV reduction for short. The aldol reaction and condensation will give us something called 1-octan-3-ohn, which will then have to reduce to 1-octan-3-ol using the MPV reduction. Here are the chemicals that are used for both of the reactions. On the left, we have the chemicals for the aldol reaction and condensation, and on the right, we have the ones for the MPV reduction. For the aldol stuff, I use formaldehyde and 2-heptanone, and both were purchased online. I was able to get the formaldehyde for pretty cheap, but the 2-heptanone cost me a ridiculous $70. For the MPV reduction, I made the aluminum isopropoxide in a previous video. The anhydrous isopropyl alcohol was prepared by adding some molecular sieves to some 99% isopropyl alcohol that I purchased from a local company. For the aldol reaction and condensation, we'll need a 3 necked round bottom flask and an addition funnel. To the addition funnel, we added 10 milliliters of 10% sodium hydroxide solution, 20 milliliters of 37% formaldehyde, and 10 milliliters of water. I added the sodium hydroxide first, followed by the formaldehyde, then the water, but the order really doesn't matter. To the round bottom flask, I then poured in 30 milliliters of 2 heptanone, which was the entire bottle. Then, after all of the 2 heptanone had been added, I stoppered the flask. I turned on some strong stirring, and then I opened the addition funnel to slowly add the solution into the 2-heptanone. I added everything over the course of something like 30 minutes to an hour, but I probably could have added it much quicker. Once everything had been added, the addition funnel was removed, and things were allowed to stir for about 5 hours. This is the overall reaction scheme for both the aldol reaction and the aldol condensation. The first part is the aldol reaction, where we react formaldehyde and 2-heptanone to produce an intermediate. When the intermediate is heated, it will undergo a dehydration reaction to form 1-octan-3-ohn. That's just a very quick overview though, and I'm going to break it down mechanistically. As I just said a second ago, the first thing that occurs is the aldol reaction. In the first step, we have a reaction between an acidic hydrogen of 2-heptanone and the sodium hydroxide. The hydrogens that I've written out on the 2-heptanone are more acidic because the resulting negative charge is stabilized. If you take a look at the structures in the brackets, you'll see how the charge is stabilized. The negative charge on the carbon can rearrange and move to the oxygen. Because the negative charge isn't just sitting on the carbon and it can move around, the burden of the negative charge is spread out, and this makes it more stable. Just as a quick side note, it's also possible to deprotonate one of the hydrogens that I've labeled in blue. To a certain extent, this also occurs, and this is one major source of side products. Moving forward with the reaction, our deprotonated 2-heptanone goes on to attack a formaldehyde. The bond between the oxygen and the carbon in the formaldehyde isn't super even and the electrons lie closer to the oxygen. This leaves a partial positive charge on the carbon, which is attacked by the electron-rich 2-heptanone intermediate. As a somewhat lengthy side note, it's also possible for the 2-heptanone to attack its own carbon-oxygen bond instead of the formaldehyde. This is the reason why we mix the sodium hydroxide with the formaldehyde and not the 2-heptanone. The formaldehyde has no acidic protons to deprotonate, so when we mix it with sodium hydroxide, nothing really happens. When the formaldehyde and base mixture is added, the 2-heptanone is deprotonated, but it quickly reacts with the formaldehyde. To a certain extent, some 2-heptanone will still react with itself, and this is another source of side products. 
Anyway, after the intermediate attacks the formaldehyde, we form a new carbon-carbon bond. The negatively charged oxygen attacks a water molecule to form an alcohol group, and the hydroxide that we used in the beginning is regenerated. There are two main products of aldol reactions, a beta-hydroxyaldehyde and a beta-hydroxyketone. In this case, we have a beta-hydroxyaldehyde, but it's just an intermediate and we're going to be reacting it again in just a minute. After five hours, the reaction flask was placed on a 50C water bath and it was heated for another two hours. When the reaction mixture is heated, the beta-hydroxyaldehyde intermediate will undergo a dehydration reaction. Again, a hydroxyl group picks up one of the acidic hydrogens and a negative charge is formed. With a little bit of heat, the electrons move to form a double bond and the hydroxyl group is popped off. This leads to the formation of the final aldol product, which is generally known as an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. In the 1-octan-3-ohn molecule, I've actually written the C for one of the carbons, so I could highlight the carbon that came from the formaldehyde. Under normal circumstances though, this C would not be written. Once we hit the 2 hour mark, the water bath was taken away, and I let things stir overnight. In the morning, the contents of our reaction flask was transferred to a separatory funnel. In the procedure that I'm following, the next step is to neutralize the sodium hydroxide using hydrochloric acid, but let's pretend that I totally didn't forget to do this. The layers in the separatory funnel were allowed to separate, and the lower aqueous layer was drained off. The aqueous layer still contains some of our product, and we're going to have to extract it a few times using toluene. The upper layer, which contains our product, residual 2 heptanone and other side products, is drained into a separate flask. Now it's time to extract our aqueous layer, and to do this, we pour it back into a separatory funnel. The aqueous layer is then washed three times using 15 milliliters of toluene each time. The procedure for washing things is pretty simple. The separatory funnel is capped and taken off the stand, and we shake it vigorously. Sometimes some pressure will build up, so while the separatory funnel is tilted backwards, we occasionally open the stopcock. Once we feel like we've mixed things adequately, we can place it back on the stand and allow the layers to separate. The lower aqueous layer is drained back into the Erlenmeyer flask, and the upper toluene layer is poured into the flask with the rest of our product. The aqueous layer is returned to the separatory funnel, we add 15 milliliters more of toluene, and the washing steps are repeated two more times. All of our product, which is combined with the toluene washings, are added back to the separatory funnel. To get everything out of the flask, we wash it with a little bit of toluene. I then add about 25 milliliters of saturated salt solution. Like before, I cap the separatory funnel, I take it off, shake it, vent it, and then put it back on the stand for the layers to separate. The purpose of this step is to remove water from the organic layer by osmotically pulling it into the saturated salt solution. Once the layers have separated, you can see that the organic layer is a lot less opaque and white. The bottom aqueous layer is drained off and discarded, and our upper layer which contains our product is poured out into an Erlenmeyer flask. The organic solution that we have here is still slightly opaque, so to dry it further, I add some anhydrous magnesium sulfate. I mix things around and then let it stand for about 30 minutes, and we're left with a nice clear solution. The solution is then filtered through a little bit of cotton to separate out the magnesium sulfate. Once most of our crude product has passed through, the flask and the magnesium sulfate is washed with a little bit of toluene. Once we're finished filtering things, I remove the funnel, and I set things up for a vacuum distillation. So this is what our setup looks like. On the left, we have our flask with the heating mantle, and on the right, we have our cow adapter connected to the vacuum. The cow adapter is very useful in vacuum distillations, because it allows us to swap the flask without removing the vacuum. In most distillations, we have to collect more than one fraction, and when it's under vacuum, it kind of becomes a pain to swap things out. With this adapter, we can keep everything under vacuum and simply turn it, and the flask that the liquid goes into will change. 
The purpose of this distillation isn't to isolate our one octane three own, and it's simply to remove toluene and any much higher boiling point side products. With heating and vacuum on, we bring things to a boil, and we start to collect our first fraction, which is toluene. Our desired ketone fraction comes over between 60 and 85 C at a pressure of 15 millimeters of mercury. The temperature that our fraction comes over at though is really dependent on the pressure and my pressure is not 15 millimeters of mercury. My vacuum pulls at around 37 millimeters of mercury, so my fraction came over between 85 and 110 C. Once we reach the end of our toluene fraction, the temperature will start to increase and we have to change our collection flask. For me, this occurred at around 85C, and now I collect everything up until about 110C. The stuff that we're collecting here in the middle flask contains our desired product as well as some side products. Again, at some point, the distillation slowed down and the temperature increased, so I swapped to the third flask. In the end, I'll be combining the second and third fraction, so this separation is really unnecessary, I was just trying to see if I was able to isolate one octane three own. Just for the record though, I wasn't. Eventually the temperature rose to about 110 or 115 C, so I stopped the distillation. In the distillation flask, we're left with a lot of thick yellow goo, and this was discarded. In the second and third flask, we have our slightly opaque mixtures of one octane three own, and side product ketones. The next thing that we want to do is carry out our MPV reduction. To start things off, we add both of the ketone fractions to a larger round bottom flask. On top of the ketone fractions, I then poured in 150 milliliters of anhydrous isopropanol. I then weighed out about 3.1 grams of aluminum isopropoxide, and added about 15 milliliters of anhydrous isopropanol to it. Using a glass stir rod, I mixed things around and tried to break up any large chunks. The aluminum isopropoxide suspension that we made was then added to the reaction flask. A small amount of isopropanol was used to wash the crystallizing dish as well as the funnel. I then set things up for a fractional distillation, and to show the whole apparatus, I used a very skillful moving shot. A heating mantle is placed under the flask, and we turn it on to get the distillation started. At first, our reaction mixture is going to be opaque, with aluminum isopropoxide floating around, but as we heat things up, everything should eventually dissolve. It also takes on a yellow color, but I'm not exactly sure why it does this. The column is insulated with some aluminum foil to keep it hot so the vapors can make it over. Not too long after starting, we'll start to get some vapors coming over, and we want to maintain the temperature at around 75 C. We maintain the temperature here because this is below the boiling point of isopropyl alcohol, but above that of acetone. The reaction is an equilibrium reaction, and by slowly removing the acetone, we push it towards completion. Now I'd like to just quickly go over the reaction mechanism. The carbonyl group of the 1-octane-3-ohn starts things off by attacking the aluminum isopropoxide. In one concerted step, an isopropoxide group in the aluminum isopropoxide donates a hydrogen to the carbonyl, and it's then itself kicked off as acetone. A random isopropyl alcohol molecule then comes along and attacks the aluminum. The isopropyl alcohol group that just attached donates its hydrogen to the oxygen in red, and the bond between the red oxygen and the aluminum is broken. This leads to the formation of our final 1-octane-3-all product, and it regenerates the aluminum isopropoxide catalyst. The proper way to know the end point of this reaction is to test the distillate for the presence of acetone. A common and easy way to do this is to use something called 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine, but unfortunately, I didn't have any of this. Because I had no way of testing whether there was acetone left in the distillate, I just kept the distillation going until it looked like I had about 30 milliliters left. 
The distillation apparatus was dismantled, and we were left with this orange liquid in the reaction flask. Now it's time for the workup, and the first thing that we do is add 50 milliliters of 20% sulfuric acid. After adding the sulfuric acid, I stir things for a few minutes, and then I let the layer separate. It separates pretty cleanly, with a clear aqueous layer on the bottom, and a slightly yellow organic layer on top. To separate our desired organic layer from the aqueous layer, we transfer everything into a separatory funnel. The lower aqueous layer was drained into an Erlenmeyer flask, and it can be discarded. The organic layer is then washed with about 20 milliliters of distilled water. Just like before, things were mixed thoroughly and then placed back on the stand to separate. Once the layers have separated, we then drain off our lower water washing. The organic layer is then poured out into a beaker. It has some water in it and we need to dry it up, so just like before, we add a little bit of magnesium sulfate. After we let it stand for a while, we're left with a nice clear solution, and it's time to filter off the magnesium sulfate. Just like before, the magnesium sulfate is separated by filtering it through a little bit of cotton. Once we're done filtering, we set things up for a vacuum distillation. Unfortunately, I don't have a cow adapter that's the appropriate size, so this time I have to hot swap things. As we heat things up, we'll start to collect our distillate, and things came over in three main fractions. The first fraction that came over was mostly just isopropanol, the second one I believe was 2-heptanol, and our desired product came over in the last one. At the end of the distillation, you can see here the incredible yield of product that I got. I transferred all of the product to a small amber glass vial, and the total weight came out to be about 0.5 grams. This corresponds to an incredible yield of about 2%. To make matters even better, this is a crude yield, and it probably only is 50% 1 octane 3 all. As a test, I left out some of the 1 octane 3 all outside, but it didn't seem to attract many bugs. I watched it over the course of a few hours, and unfortunately, the only thing that happened was a spider drowning. During the filming though, I had at least 10 flies swarming everywhere. They weren't biting insects, but there was definitely an above normal amount, but I'm not sure if this was a coincidence or directly related. I did a little Google searching, and I found a paper that tested the ability of the 1 octan 3 all to attract insects. Their experimental procedure was a little bit more structured, and it didn't just involve pouring out some 1 octan 3 all onto a plastic spoon but it didn't really seem to work well for them either. The 1 octan 3 all seemed to work the best when it was combined with another insect attractant like CO2. I was honestly a little bit disappointed when I found out that it didn't just attract bugs like crazy. I think the most disappointing part though is that later on I found that I could have just bought the 1 octan 3 all. A perfume site actually sells it for cheaper than I bought the 2 heptanone for, so I ended up buying some and now I have about 80 milliliters. At some point, I'm going to reoxidize the 1 octan 3 all back to 1 octan 3 own. If you recall, this was an intermediate in this preparation, but it's also a cool molecule on its own. This chemical is responsible for the metallic scent of blood and the metallic smell you get when you touch metal. In either case, you're not really smelling metal at all, and you're actually just smelling 1 octan 3 own. That's kind of it for now, and I'll post a new video soon. As usual, I'd like to extend a big thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon, and especially those who donate $5 or more. Anyone who donates and supports me on Patreon gets to see my videos 24 hours before I release it to YouTube, and if you donate $5 or more, you get your name at the end of the video like you see here. In the next few months though, I want to work on my Patreon page a lot, and I want to get more rewards going, and maybe even get some higher tier ones, and I want to also offer some Patreon exclusive content. Also, as usual, here's the videos that I've currently filmed, and the ones I plan to work on. If you have any suggestions or ideas, please feel free to leave them in the comments.